Hello. When I teach permaculture, um, particularly composting and soil making, I generally talk about the uh, carbon nitrogen ratio one part nitrogen to around 30 parts carbon. And I feel this ratio is translatable into the subject that I want to speak to today on the heterodoxy and its one part relationship to the orthodoxy, which may can be considered the majority. One of the questions I had going into this talk, into this generative space of exploring the relationship between the heterodox and orthodox is wondering whether, like most things, the integration of the two to create a bigger whole or a third way is uh, can, that metaphor or that languaging or that thinking or those ideas can, can translate. As a guide in men's work, we talk about the base behavior below the belt, the animal, the primal, the underworlding, the creaturely. And then we talk about the enlightenment of the upper body. But when the two are integrated, we talk about a third, more full sense of ourselves, the creaturely and the enlightened being. And I wonder whether these metaphors or these analogies translate to speaking about the heterodoxy and orthodoxy and their interrelationship. And why this subject is so important at the moment is that how I'm reading it, there is a political erasure going on of the heterodox across many spaces, in universities, in institutions of all forms, hospitals, schools, prisons, and my experience is limited to Jarrah Mother Country, where I live, and more broadly, the, the nation state called Australia, the colonial state called Australia. When I was a kid, my parents took me to church and I developed a healthy mistrust of organized religion by the time I was a teenager. But as I've aged, I've reached back to some of the stories, some of the myths of my first religion or my only religion. And one of the stories that I keep coming back to is Christ's turning of the money tables and how connected I feel to that story. And in many respects, the institutionalization of Jesus Christ in all the various forms of that have created power structures um, that have completely moved from right story to wrong story in the turning of the money tables to some of the most powerful property owners in the world, being the Catholic Church or the Protestant Church, etc. Christ's disruption of the institutional corruption in the church of his day to seeing the church that sprung from his teaching taking on those same characteristics. And I'm wondering whether there is just this propensity for all emergent, beautiful thoughts, myths, poems, songs, ways of being, and even permaculture to move into wrong story, to move from the loopy or the marginal or the unpopular edge 
and in the popularization take on the um, the subjectivities of the orthodoxy. This is not to create a good bad binary or a good and evil binary between heterodox on one side and orthodox. I feel like both are important. The orthodoxy creates stability and a conserving effect in society. But the heterodox is the disruption, the trouble, the, the curiosity, the, um, the questioning, the disruption to the status quo. Much of that one part of nitrogen to the voluminous carbon being the orthodoxy maybe the analogy works here is really important to make soil in order to make more life possible uh, currently um, the australian permaculture convergence is just about to take place in adelaide and months and months and months ago i put in a proposal to explore the relationship between permaculture and the pharmaceutical industry, particularly large corporate pharmaceutical companies. What is the relationship between uh, biological and social, local responsibility to life and big global capitalism's um, powerful structures and institutions, what is the relationship? Um, so my paper was rejected and I was a little taken aback. I am the few, one of the few academics in Australia that has based their doctoral work within the ethics and principles of permaculture. I have, through my academic training, learned the research method, how to investigate material, um, how to find the sources of things, much like an investigative journalist might do. And so being one of the few academics working within the permaculture movement in Australia, I am curious to know why my paper was rejected. There has been, over the last three or four years, within the left, particularly the green left, a biopolitical turn from fellow permaculturalists looking at, say, big agriculture and big chemicals and being highly critical of those corporations such as Dow and Monsanto and Bayer. And so when Pfizer and AstraZeneca and Moderna came into our lives, I was saying, perhaps these are the same companies as that we've been turning our critical attention to but just in another area, in pharmaceuticals rather than in big agricultural chemicals. And I just thought this was a common sense approach to building a healthy skepticism to a fix that was coming from companies that have long track records of corporate criminality, like those I mentioned from big ag and big chemicals. So I've been curious and watching this unfurl, this erasure of heterodoxy when it comes to the pharmaceutical industry within left discourses. The playwright Ibsen has an interesting quote that goes something like, the majority is always wrong, the minority is really right. And I feel this is potentially a 
a provocation to investigate the problem of an orthodoxy that is too full of hubris and so full of hubris that it sets out to cancel and censor the heterodoxy. And this is, to my mind, very dangerous in society. The heterodoxy is that pricking the consciousness or pricking the um, status quo, waking up the status quo from uh, com compliance or complacency. That's the role. Whether the heterodoxy is way off the mark or not, it actually doesn't matter. Its, it's role is to prick awake the orthodoxy that may be getting too comfortable. One of our videos, one of our artist as family videos we made several months ago with a filmmaker called David Ma, who I interviewed um, and heard from his experience of being vaccine injured. That was taken down last week with a statement from YouTube saying that only the WHO and expert medical um, or medical experts can have an opinion on this or words to that effect. We'll, we'll share the link to that or at least show the documentation of that in the video somewhere here or in the notes. And I appealed that and said, how can a conversation between two consenting adults discussing the life experience of one of those adults be medical misinformation. How have we got to the point where someone who went along with the dominant narrative and got injured and then began asking questions, how can that be censored? And if, if it is censored, is that not extremely dangerous? in terms of making known that some people are getting harmed by a medical intervention made by large pharmaceutical companies with a long track record of harming people, harming ecologies and operating fraudulently. These are all well documented. They are easily cross referenceable. They are easily located through the court cases, through the fines, through media articles. These are also compiled in various websites. So how, how is it possible that we've got to a place where corporations with long criminal track records of causing harm to humans cease to be examined critically. And if this is really happening, as we've experienced it happening to us, is that not a red flag, an alarm bell for losing democratic processes for losing uh, free speech. I appealed to YouTube censorship and to their credit, they reinstated that video. Throughout COVID, we've made a number of videos of which seven have been censored by YouTube, all of which we repealed and three in which they reinstated. So is there something going on? Is it just our imagination? Or is there an enclosure of free speech? Is there a political erasure of the heterodoxy going on? We'd love to know what you think. We'd love to hear your comments. We'd love to hear your criticisms in an open-hearted and curious manner. Thanks for listening.